Well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you, and uh, thanks a lot for the uh, charming introduction and all this energy in the uh, in the poem, which was uh, very uh, cool. Um, I have the pleasure to talk about what I believe is one of the major shifts we are observing at the moment when it comes to the articulation of human needs and how we depict that in organizational vehicles, and particularly what that means also for social entrepreneurship. So over the last years at Sandbox, we've had the pleasure to bring together some of the most interesting young innovators below the age of 30, so young social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, designers, artists, and we've observed some trends, some patterns that seem to defy some of the traditional notions of how we thought about organizations. And so some of these entrepreneurs we see here, to the left we see uh, Sebastian Lindstrom, who traveled 30 African countries on the search for unsung heroes, so people on the ground who do make big things happen in local communities, but are usually not portrayed in the West. He portrayed them, documented them, and traveled 30 African, uh, sorry, 30 Western countries, actually, to then showcase them um, and their achievements. This is Mark Kegwa. Mark Kegwa is a great uh, social media entrepreneur in Kenya. He does a lot of research around social media, what are the trends in social media, and then he travels the world to put Kenya on the map in terms of um, how a lot of radical business model innovation innovation is happening there. This is uh, Yuri Maxwell, um, who set up the Design for America, which is helping young people in college to um, become better in design and then to use all their creative skills to make cool projects and, and create organizations out of it. And this is Robin Scott, uh, based here in London, who founded One Leap, an organization that brings together people with ideas and those people who have the money and not necessarily the ideas. And so. Um, it's kind of a matchmaking for people who really um, need to meet, but would usually not meet in real life because um, all the filters you usually need to go through to come to a good person um, are usually taking too long to get good ideas to the people who actually can help them. So all these people are in completely different fields, completely different industries, but we believe what brings them together is that they're part of Generation Y question mark. So a generation that is not an age group, not the 20 to 30 year olds who are um, a lot of times, obviously, among age groups much more different from each other, the person in the village who is happy to settle and to build a house is probably very different from um, the young social entrepreneur in London who wants to make a global impact. Um, so we found, well, maybe there's another kind of um, principle at play. And so we found that the principle is really that there's a similar mindset among some of these most interesting people, which is that they try to put meaning to things. They want to you know, they want to earn good money, they want to make a lot of interesting things, but they also want to put meaning to what they do. So they constantly ask the question, why? Why am I doing this? Why are you doing this? Why should we do this? And so this generation, though, has a big, big problem. We face, basically, the challenge that there is, in terms of traditional organizational vehicles, on one hand side, we have these for-profit organizations. So for-profit organizations focus, obviously, on profits. It's the ultimate motive. Uh, there's a little bit of CSR going on, you know, sometimes you get the opportunity to travel to another country and do an internship somewhere for a few months to somehow have the feeling that you do something. But it's very um, outside the integrated of, of integration of business models, so it's very peripheral. And so the problem here is that on one hand side, it helps people to develop professionally, it helps them to develop um, personally, it has great career structures, it, there's a certain idea of how you can actually um, evolve. But then, on the other hand side, maybe there's a limited meaning to it. Like it's only after the, having sold the 40,000 uh, yogurt somewhere in Paris, people at Danone might at some point think, well, but what actually do we do in the world that actually makes a difference? On the other hand then, as a knee-jerk response, we have the not-for-profit organizations, traditional social enterprises, charities, NGOs, that focus on social impact, that focus on meaning, that focus on somehow making a difference, but that a lot of times really fail to be profitable or that even don't want to be profitable. And what I've seen a lot in that um, sector, I feel, is that there's a lot of judgment in terms of people who actually make a difference and then also want to earn money. So it's looked or frowned upon a little bit. Um, why would you appropriate funds from the venture um, to pay yourself? So the question becomes, why would we be judgmental about people who actually do a lot of good? Why wouldn't they be able to pay themselves in a, in a good way? So point being here, the problem we face is we have organizations that over-focus on social impact, that neglect the financial side, and that therefore neglect career structure for young people. So how would you actually grow in the social sector? At the LSE, what we see constantly, what makes my heart bleeding, is you have all these 
amazing graduates. They're amazingly good in, in, in their skill sets. They, can, they write brilliant business plans, a lot of times actually brilliant social business plans. And yet still they go into consulting and banking because there's a loan to be paid. There is a certain idea of you know, expectations of families and so on. So the question becomes, how do we actually balance this that we enable people to pay back their student loans while actually making a difference? And so the problem is that we still face nowadays um, organizations that are implicitly based on this very, very, very old Maslow hierarchy of needs. Who of you came across the Maslow hierarchy of needs? So as most of you, it seems, right? It's the very old idea that human beings have very similar needs. We first want to fulfill our material needs, then emotional needs, uh, sorry, then safety needs, then emotional needs, esteem needs. And if we, see, if, if we still have time at some point, we can self-actualize ourselves, right? We keep that for later. The problem here is that it's a very linear approach to life, right? It's kind of, you first do well, so you first set up Microsoft in Bill Gates' case, and then you do good, you set up a foundation. Very linear approach to life. First do well, then do good. The problem with this is, it is A, very self-focused, right? It's thinking about yourself, it's thinking about how I do first build up my material, and then I afterwards somehow self-actualize myself. Um, so it's very linear, but it's also um, kind of very um, not focused on relationships. So what we believe is that there is kind of a, a shift happening, which is that there is a lateral circle of needs emerging. So that people want to fulfill these needs at the same time, rather than after and after. You want to have a job or a thing you do which actually provides you with profit while having a certain meaning. And it is also the understanding that it is relational. It is in my enlightened self-interest to be not too self-interested. Because I understand that in a relationship economy, in a knowledge economy where it's all about co-creation, it's all about projects, it is in my enlightened self-interest that I cater to the circle of needs of others. Because the better I cater to their needs, the better they can cater to my needs, and the better they want to cater to my needs. So we believe that this is kind of a lateral circle um, that is embedded in other different lateral circles, which then needs different types of organizations that cater to it. The exciting thing now we see is that the emergence of new technology, social media, it allows us obviously to, on the one hand side, be seen globally. It allows us to accelerate our actions globally. But I think one thing which is completely underestimated is that it also allows us different governance structures. It allows lateral accountability. It allows peer-to-peer -peer control. If it's very visible what I'm doing, if it can be seen social media-wise or in other channels, I, again, have it in my enlightened self-interest to at least be seen as someone who takes care of others, because otherwise I would be perceived as someone who is, you know, narcissistic, self-centered, whatever the, the words for it, but point being, it is in my enlightened self-interest to be not too self-centered. The point being here is that if you look at someone like Brad Fisher, Brad Fisher is uh, one of our former community managers, um, he's a great guy, who is embedded, uh, this is a LinkedIn mapping, so it's a, it's a really nice um, kind of software mapping uh, different networks and so he here has his contacts at Sandbox, then he has his contacts at the LSE, he has contacts in different other organizations. But when we sent him on a project, he was embedded in all these different networks and he was always in, in accountable to at least three or four different people at different types of organizations. So I as his supervisor could outsource a lot of the kind of pressure I had to put on him because he was actually laterally controlled by a lot of other people around him with whom he did the project. So again, technology in that phase, if it was properly used, actually self-regulated how they achieved the goals um, we defined with them um, beforehand. And the interesting thing is, when you think about all these things, articulation of, or new articulation of needs, um, that you see this kind of knowledge economy emerging where hierarchical organizations are more and more um, the, the wrong solutions for radically um, kind of innovative uh, measures that need to be taken when you have an um, economic crisis or when you have all these, these um, challenges we face, we see that we need a different type of organization that can actually cater to that. So the suggestion from our side is to balance strategically financial and social impact on the same strategic level. So it is organizations where there is no inherent tension between social and financial. In any organization in the world, if you look at models like Porter, for example, it's a shared value idea, 
but still it is on the based on the ultimate motive an organization should make a profit and social can be a way to do that when did we come to the point that we accept that profit should be the ultimate motive it was somehow a misunderstanding in the 18th century when some people read Adam Smith the wrong way and then they thought okay well this should be how organizations work why would we accept that and then on the other hand side why would we accept that social organizations should only have a social impact but not make money out of it so I think there's kind of these two um, very weird understandings of how organizations should work so we believe that we have to and bring these together and say, we should make a lot of profit, but we also should have a real meaning to what we do. And so our definition of an impact organization is that an impact organization balances social and financial impact on the same strategic level. It's governed by a logic of lateral accountability, so peer-to-peer -peer control. So you basically take accountability from the organizational level to the individual level, where people are accountable to each other. So you can't outsource responsibility, right? You can't say, oh yeah, but my supervisor told me this. Or you can't say, well, my supervisor messed it up. No, 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 it's you. You build it on a network organization on an individual level. And by this, it reconciles the near intention between social and financial uh, goals. So how does this work? I mean, that sounds very lofty, right? And that sounds very in the clouds. So how can we break that down? Well, we believe there's five pillars to it. These five pillars, if you start an organization from scratch, you can take them um, from day one. If you're in an existing organization, you can tweak these pillars after and after. All these pillars can be con concretely worked on. The first pillar is the impact mission. The impact mission is the question, why do we do what we do? Why is that relevant to us, to our employees, to our stakeholders? But also, more importantly, why is that relevant towards the outside? Why is that relevant towards other organizations? So how can you create that? Well, a lot of organizations, what you see that do it really nicely, co-create it together with stakeholders, right? They bring in all the most important stakeholders, employees, customers, others, and say, what do we really want? What do we really need? And how can we do this together? And how can we answer the why for everyone who's in this room versus just for a select group of people? We can hire committed and aligned people. I mean, at Zappos, that someone had this rule that you could basically get a big paycheck if you would resign, if you put money over being at Zappos. So basically the idea is that only the most committed people stay if they actually get money for leaving. And the, um, these type of models is basically the idea of, okay, hire the most committed people who actually believe in the vision versus in the money that comes with it. And then integrating all these um, kind of the, the question of why into all existing processes or uh, systems. And I feel the interesting thing is that when you have enlightened leaders, so people who actually embody the values of an organization. Uh, this is Steve Chambers at uh, Cisco, who is a very traditional for-profit organization. But one thing he understood is that in 20 years, if you are particularly in developing countries, there's no more question. If you can't cater to local communities, you will be irrelevant. There's no way that you can survive. So it is an absolute necessity to get away from the absolute for-profit uh, focus. So how can we do this? Well, we can... Um, we can understand that um, we can practice pragmatic messianism. So it's actually something we observed over the last years more and more. When you have really charismatic leaders, what they do is they have a very compelling story. How their own story relates to the organization, but also how the employee's stories relate to the organization, right? How can I as an individual form an identity that is completely related to the organization? No more cognitive dissonance that I go home and I feel no, but I don't feel comfortable about having traded these shares and now I destroyed five more lives. It's a big cognitive dissonance, right? But if you can actually identify yourself with this organization because the leader is able to articulate a storyline that fits into your own life. Um, make it about your followers, not about the leader. Um, some of you might have seen this amazing um, dancing guy. I don't know who of you has seen the dancing guy? I would love to show it. We can maybe show it in some of the breaks, but um, it's the whole idea that there's a crazy guy dancing on a, um, in a park, and uh, there's some music to it, and then at some point some, someone else joins him in crazily dancing around. And then after and after, you have more and more people jumping in. And at the beginning, yeah, I think we have one person here who does it amazingly well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll count on you later to, uh, to do the movement. Um, but the whole idea is that if you see afterwards, the whole park at some point dances with the crazy dancing guy. Because the crazy dancing guy was able to motivate the first people around him, the first followers, to do similar things. And usually the idea is that people emulate followers, not the leader. 
So the important thing is that you nurture the followers around you who then again have a compelling story and this compelling story usually has to be told by the followers, not only by the leader. And then rewarding talent and success with opportunity rather than for money um, is, is something we've seen a lot over the last years. The third pillar is genuine values. Um, who of you came across the Holstein Manifesto? Oh yeah. So um, the Holstein Manifesto basically um, is uh, three kids, uh, around 25, sitting in Central Park in, in, in New York and writing down what are our core values, what should an organization mean to us, and what does that mean for our lives. And they wrote this down, and then this manifesto went viral. And in the end it was downloaded 80 million times. It turned out to be the best marketing campaign in the social sector we've seen for ages. Why was it? Because they were able to articulate values in a way that was much more genuine than you know all these organizations who have their big value statements on the homepage, but then you go to the employees and ask them what are the values of the organization, they would be like, oh, let me briefly check the homepage to, to confirm, right? So there's no real understanding what the values are actually. So the question is how do we put genuine values into play that actually lead every decision that needs to be made? So how can you create it? Well, one thing is, writing pledges. So letting everyone in the organization write a pledge, a specific action point that is related to the vision and the mission of the company, and that really coherently and consistently depicts what the organization needs to achieve. Another one is, um, I mean, that's been happening a lot over the last years, writing organizational manifestos co-created by people within the organization to get a feeling for what people actually want to stand for, and then making these values tangible and um, ideally, um, and that's a, a presentation for itself, ideally trying to curate serendipity um, that enables people to um, have positive coincidences happen much more often. Letter accountability is all about how do you actually democratize the organization in a way that the CEO and the executive team are as accountable to the rest as the rest is accountable to the CEO. For example, transparently showing the goals of the CEO so that everyone knows what's actually happening within the organization and then last but not least, the fifth point is KPIs, incentives. Um, these incentives obviously have to be um, aligned with these kind of lateral needs we just talked about. So non-monetary incentives, uh, pet projects, flexibility, time and location, and uh, other factors. And I get the uh, frenetic uh, timekeeping uh, advice, so I want to close with, with one thought, which is basically when you think about this bar as your life, it's an idea my friend Robin Scott at some point um, ins inspired us with. You have this bar as your, as your life, your achievements. And your life starts at some point in 1980, some before, some after. And it ends somewhere 2080, maybe with modern medicine a bit longer, a bit shorter. And you have a lot of bars around you, right? You have people who lived before you, you have people who lived after you. But the question is, if you would have a car accident tomorrow, or if you would die tomorrow, what if you actually would stay on here? Would you actually have mattered to people's lives? Or would you just have been there to enjoy like roaming around and somehow doing something? And so I want to leave you with my favorite quote, which is that you should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, because indeed it is the only thing that ever has. And with this, I wish you a great day. Thank you.